globally, but uh, let me give you some uh, ideas and some heads up on that. Um, I have a, a number of slides here to, to talk about. Um, I think Cindy's already given me the introduction of who I am. Um, I'm originally from Scotland, but lived in Hong Kong now 20 years, or 20 and a half years. And I'm also very proud to be on the, the board of the Ottawa chapter of HKCBA. Uh, and I try and go there at least once a year in Canada, twice or three times a year. Unfortunately, this year, with all the flights being cancelled, it looks very uh, difficult to do any travel this year. So I was talking to Vanessa in Vancouver about doing a, a presentation about uh, what's really happening and HG Wells and the time machine sprung to mind. Um, more to do with, we didn't know which button we were pressing on the time machine when we got it in and the time machine took off. Um, we don't know what date we pressed. Uh, we don't know how long it will take to get to where we're getting to or where we will land. But I think the important thing is we have to be ready for whenever the time machine does land. And I'm really talking about the, the pandemic around the world and the virus and how it's disrupted all our lives at the same time. So we have to be ready for what's going to happen afterwards. And the key point really of my presentation is that there's parts of the world already opening up and that happens to be, to be Asia. I'll come back to that uh, later. So how bad is it? Uh, well, I think we all know, we read the papers and we see the news. Um, COVID-19, a uh, virus has killed uh, 247,000 people worldwide and infected uh, 3.5 million people. Um, that has had a major impact on the, the global economy. Uh, America, for instance, Dow Jones Index, uh, largest drop um, since the uh, 1930s. And that's also the same impact on other stock markets around the world, including Hong Kong. And um, with economic problems, we've also seen that impacting unemployment. If you look at the American numbers, they were staggering um, only after a few weeks. Uh, Canada is not exempt from this either. Their unemployment rate has also has risen. And Hong Kong, which is where I'm based, um, we've had a 2.8% unemployment rate for a long time. And this goes back um, a few months, but um, for about 10, 14 years almost, it's been a very low number, 2.8 for eight years, a bit lower than that um, until we got to SARS in the 2000s. Now we're at 4.2% in Hong Kong. Partly that is because of COVID, but also partly because of the protests we had uh, last year and how they impacted um, retail hospitality, um, uh, restaurants, flying to Hong Kong, people are afraid of coming here for the protests. So all these things coming together in a perfect storm. Flights, one of the key things that we all take for granted until recently, and 90% of all airplanes around the world are no longer flying. Cathay Pacific, as you see there, is one example of that. Uh, I think we had some flights recently where there's only about 500 people have flown in one day. Um, so that's having a major impact on people getting around to do business and meeting people. Then we end up with uh, technology like this to help us to facilitate the business. Cargo ships, uh, they're a major part of how goods move around the world and we sometimes forget about them. Um, a big reason why uh, China has had issues in getting things moved around as they have come out of the, the virus is that the ships and the planes are not in the places they should be to allow the movement of goods. So 76% of all the sailings around the world have been cancelled, stopped. Um, and these are to avoid losses because empty ships don't make any money. The global supply chain has more or less collapsed. Um, China usually had around 1,400 cargo flights a week. And that's moving things from all around China to the rest of the world. During the height of the virus alone, only 43 flights were recorded. And a lot of them were actually the protective gear and masks that other countries wanted, as well as the testing kits that China produced. We have this uh, wonderful device, the face mask. Um, during SARS, I avoided it uh, a lot because I, I couldn't work and breathe and drive my car when I had a face mask. Um, and I was still reluctant to wear one in Hong Kong until maybe a month, a month ago. I bought masks when I was in Thailand on holiday in February, gave it all to my colleagues who had kids to help the kids. 
and then realize that one of the ways to protect other people from me and also myself is to wear a mask. So we now have to wear masks. And luckily in Canada, it's not that warm yet. Hong Kong is about 28 degrees today. And you can imagine wearing a mask just uh, builds up a lot of, uh, of uh, water as well. So not very comfortable. Hong Kong, as I mentioned, has been hit the double whammy. 2019 with the protests and now the COVID virus. And today, the Hong Kong government, that's only today, announced that this is the worst GDP slump on record for Hong Kong, 8.9% uh, contraction. So we are in a deep recession, according to the financial secretary today. They do, however, think that by the end of the year, we'll be out of the recession. Hong Kong's economy is quite resilient compared to other economies, so there's still a chance that may happen because of our proximity to China and to the rest of, of Asia. So I, I was thinking about pandemics and viruses, not it's something I do very often, but um, when we watch pandemic movies, um, Contagion and other movies, not that I tend to watch them very much, nobody in any plot line ever told us that toilet paper would be our biggest concern. And funnily enough, Hong Kong, I think, started the rumor early on uh, during the virus that there's a shortage of toilet paper. All the shops were cleared out. Uh, as I was saying to uh, Cindy Vanessa earlier, I had to import some from Amazon, from America, to survive. And then toilet paper started to arrive on the shelves. Then Singapore had a problem with toilet rolls. Then I believe UK, Canada have also had the same kinds of issues. But who would have thought in pandemic crises that toilet paper would be one of our, our concerns? Also, strangely enough, I saw on the news that uh, the Pentagon confirmed, confirmed UFO sightings last month. And that's barely even news because everyone's focused on the pandemic and the, the market. So it's a good time to bring out all the, the skeletons of the cupboard, I think, uh, from, uh, from the global news. So that was the bad news. There is some positive, however. Despite all I've seen, uh, and there's a lot out there, uh, my glass of wine is still half full, it's not half empty. Um, when under lockdown in other countries, we sit and we stare at our laptops and our TVs and we tend to uh, worry about things. Um, and really, I would say that there's other economic economy, economies outside of, um, of your own where you could be trading with, you could be engaging with, uh, to either supply services or knowledge or, or a product. And Asia has opened up since the virus uh, started. Um, I know that China's not everyone's favorite country right now. Uh, and I think the news today from America, once you wake up in, in Canada and see it, is that there's a lot of um, protests about China's role in the COVID uh, virus. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but I think it, it's good to take Asia and China as an example of what happens after the COVID virus does dissipate, um, after lockdowns are lifted. Um, we're looking in the West going, well, we can never fly ever again. The world will never be the same again. Life will never be the same again. I don't actually buy into it because China has more or less bounce back to where it was before. They have technology to make sure that people have got a, a QR code to make sure they have been tested and they're clean and don't have the virus or they had the virus. Um, but they have bounced back to where they were. Um, I would try to emphasize though, because of what I'm seeing in the news today, um, trading with China is about trading with people who are similar to us, um, traders, business owners, service providers. It's not the party, so we shouldn't blame China for anything. We should be looking at what we can do and what we can do to engage with China. We all want to do business, we all want to trade. Um, so it's an important point to make, because I think there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot more of this animosity going around in the press. Surprisingly enough, I was looking at the numbers, and I do this quite regularly for different countries around the world about the investments that China makes into other markets. And I know what's happening in, in Canada and, and China regards some of the issues that are there, mostly uh, political. Um, and the amount of investments that China made last year um, was 2.75 billion US dollars. USA is 4.55 billion. Um, so Canada's double, considering the population size. 
And actually, in the last four or five years, it's been consistent as far as that number. Only one year was a much higher number. Um, I think that's due to oil and coal. But um, generally speaking, the numbers, the number of investment from China is still significant into Canada. And I'm not really seeing that dissipate. Um, there's a good point about COVID-19 and the Asia-Pacific economy. It could be a case of first in, first out that we get back in Asia quicker, and I'm already seeing that. 94% of China's manufacturing is back to normal, according to the press. But if you look at energy consumption, how much factories in China use electricity compared before to now, it's only about 79% of factories are now back into their normal um, production. That's still a very good number, but how can they then um, get the goods to the markets outside of China? That's the challenge because the cargo ships are not there and the planes are not there. They have to start moving again. I, may, I mentioned this in the, the, the blog post that came with this webinar that um, it's a very large middle class in China. Um, and it's worth, I think, 3.8 trillion US dollars if you look at their spending power. It's a huge sum of money. And it's a Hermes, uh, Hermes flagship store in Guangzhou, and it sold 2.7 million US dollars of product on its first day of opening um, about two weeks ago. So people are sitting at home going, I can't wait for a store to open so I can buy a handbag or a scarf or, or, or shoes or, or trousers. So people are willing to spend, even if they're worried, or maybe they're not worried about their jobs and the future. But I think in China, they've got past that. Online shopping, uh, basic items. We're used to Amazon uh, in the West, but in China, it's very different. And China's online grocery market, because nobody could go out to buy food, um, expected to grow 62.9% this year. Um, a huge growth compared to what they expected last year. So you're going to start seeing that people are going to rely more on online uh, globally, but more importantly in China. Um, and even a key point here about Canada and China's relationship, USA lobster is too expensive now for China. There's a tariff of 25%. So Canadian lobsters are now flying uh, on their own, maybe in planes, uh, to China in a big way. And it's not just lobsters, other things too. So despite the rhetoric, there is trade with Canada and China. Singles Day is another thing I've talked about in previous presentations. Um, and as you can see this graph, it started in 2011. And it's a day once a year in November where people who are single, bachelor days, spend money to cheer themselves up. I quite agree with that, it's a great idea. And you can see over the years how it's in increased ongoing all the time. In 2019, 38.4 billion US dollars of sales in one 24 hour period. 2.4 billion sales in the first hour. So again, I'm pointing out here that we don't have to be in a country to sell. There are ways to sell using the internet and technology. This is a very interesting one for me because flying around is key to many of us for doing business. And China's domestic aviation is actually already started. They actually opened up most of the airports um, as of last week, but they started from March, number of domestic flights. And it's getting to about 50% of where it was last year. But interesting enough, last week on Thursday, there's a, a figure came out of the air um, from a flight app. And they said out of the 3,051 commercial aircraft flying around the world on that day, of those, China, Japan, South Korea, I can't use 1,076 of those. So you imagine the countries that got hit the most by the COVID virus and the economic um, uh, downfall from that are now opening up again and flying around again, but domestically. Good news in China, tourism is back. It may also be of interest that tourism for international travel is also back. Um, we haven't seen a number of mainland tourists in Hong Kong. I'm sure you haven't seen them in Canada uh, either. But they're already booking tickets for September, October, November time with a plan that by that time, everyone can start flying around the world again. So it's a huge uptake. People want to leave their homes, also to leave their uh, countries. Uh, China shipments have sort of come back. Um, usually there's about 1,400 flights uh, a week uh, for cargo. Um, but last week uh, they did 4,877 flights. 
A lot of that was to get the protective clothing and masks that they produced out uh, to other markets, but also normal trading goods that they were stockpiling and wanting to move. Uh, might be engine parts and other things. But it's amazing. They're actually using, this is a, a Lufthansa uh, flight you see a picture of here. I've seen an Air Canada uh, flight where all the seats were taken out also. But people in China are moving things now. There is a demand to get back to normal. Um, for Hong Kong, there's been no lockdown. Uh, I still go to the office every day. Um, I still have lunch. I still have uh, the odd uh, glass of wine in the evening. Um, we have closed the bars in Hong Kong, um, but you can still go to uh, restaurants where there's maybe uh, alcohol served. Maximum of four people at any one table to try and keep the distancing down, but we haven't closed the city. Uh, Getting into Hong Kong would be a bit of a challenge. You'd have to spend 14 days in quarantine. Um, and uh, I wouldn't advise it at this moment in time. Uh, that will soon probably dissipate as well. Um, but we had 14 consecutive days as of today of zero local transmissions. We have had some uh, people coming into the city from the UK and other markets who uh, were um, uh, had the COVID virus, uh, but they were in quarantine, so it didn't spread around the community. Um, again, Hong Kong is still number one place in the world for IPOs and fundraising. Surprisingly, Shanghai has been uh, rising and raising its game, uh, mostly for uh, large domestic players. Uh, but I still think Hong Kong, as the year progresses, will regain its number one spot. It's still number one, and Shanghai is creeping up there. I don't think it will get to number one uh, yet. But the point really I make again is Hong Kong still got a lot to, a lot to offer. Um, there was a slight change year on year because of the riots and a slip in our ranking by the Heritage Foundation for um, our, um, our openness. Um, um, and uh, Hong Kong, I think Singapore was about the same rate last year. Hong Kong was about 90.2. and We've slipped down that score. America on this openness uh, um, rating, uh, America 76.8 and Canada is 78.2. So you can see we're still quite open despite the small change in our uh, ranking. Another good thing about the COVID virus and good news is that the two pandas we have at Ocean Park in Hong Kong, because there was nobody going there because they closed the park, um, the pandas mated and maybe having babies. So they obviously like the privacy and the, the quietness that they, they had uh, with nobody staring at them. So where are we now? Well, I would suggest if you're a Canadian manufacturer, supplier, educator, farmer, buyer, whatever it is you do, remember Asia's already opened up. Um, and we can sometimes get stuck in this idea that we're looking at our domestic market in Canada, which is very, very important, I know. But there's still things happening here. Um, and even if you don't really want to deal with China right now, Hong Kong is still the best place in the world to trade with Asia. I always talk about Hong Kong being a, a great invoicing hub. Um, if you're going to base yourself here, you've got the benefit of 38 double tax treaties. And they're very complex type things. And I don't want to bore you with detail, but it does mean that you have a trading arrangement with other countries. Because if you have a company here, you become a Hong Kong business. And you get the benefit from Hong Kong government and support the Hong Kong business, even though it's a Canadian parent company that is the shareholder of your business. And I always use the example of climbing up a mountain. If you're going to go to do business in Asia or China, you wouldn't climb up Mount Everest day one and say, I'm here. You take steps up a base camp, step by step by step. So in thinking about saying, I haven't got any business in Canada, or there's not much happening, how can I get into Asia? Use Hong Kong as that base camp to get yourself into the, the market. And it'll make it much easier for you. It's very cheap to set up here but it gives you a, a, a flag on the global map and the benefits of a lower tax regime and double tax treaty benefits. So think of Hong Kong as your base camp for China, but also for Asia, the rest of Asia. So as I said earlier, a Canadian company that sets up in Hong Kong is considered a Hong Kong business. Shareholder can be back in Canada and you can benefit from the double tax treaty, but also we have grants in Hong Kong, which have usually not been available because of the virus. If you have a staff in Hong Kong and an office, the government's giving out money to assist you to stay through this, but also develop new technologies or new apps that you can then use to sell to the rest of Asia and the world. So double tax treaty, I want to touch on because I don't often 
get into it into great depth. The way it works is um, set up a Hong Kong company. Very straightforward. That's what our company does day in day out. You must have an office address. That's very very important to have an, an address in Hong Kong. Resident office or even a small serviced office. We also provide those to our clients too. Must show that all decisions you make about your Hong Kong business are done here. You can't make decisions in Vancouver, Ottawa, or Montreal. You have to show that decisions made here, and you must have board meetings to show those decisions are being made here. And they must be done in Hong Kong. Employing staff helps, not a prerequisite. And if you manage to do all that, and you make money in your Hong Kong business, and you have a real tangible business going on here, it's got substance. You bring back the dividends or the profits back to your Canadian parent company and the CRA only charge 5% profits tax. And that goes both ways, even to Hong Kong. If you run the other way, it's the same way with Hong Kong. And it's a very, very useful thing that both tax regimes make their money and the profit. There's a benefit and a, an encouragement to trade between both jurisdictions, Canada, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Canada. So, Anyone wants to talk about that, happy to do so. So Hong Kong's reality. Well, that's the view from my, my window of my office. Um, we had the riots last year. Um, this will come back. Um, it's been very quiet. Um, there was a protest, a very small one, um, in a shopping mall uh, a few days ago. Um, people singing an anthem. Um, and there are people unhappy about some uh, decisions being made in Hong Kong just now. So I suspect they'll come back. I don't think it will be as bad as before. I think a lot of the steam and energy has come out of it. I, I don't know. But I think people are more concerned about surviving COVID and keeping their jobs. I think a lot of people lost their jobs because of the protests. And I think they want to try and find ways to make money now. So I'm hopeful for Hong Kong in that way. So there's Hong Kong University behind me. But I always have a but to go along with this. Life goes on. Hong Kong is a lot more resilient um, than many people realize. It's a very key market around the world. Finance makes the city go round, as does its people. And we still function in difficult times. Our offices stayed open. The internet still works. The stock market still works. The banks still work. Everyone is still pulling together to make things work, uh, even under the protests last year um, or the COVID virus this year. And this too, I'm sure, will pass. Another nice view of Hong Kong. So, what a year, eh? It's only May, we have a long way to go. But I see a great light at the end of the tunnel. And I see great light in Asia for business for Canada. Thank you. So I'm open to questions and I'll try and give some answers. Thank you, Kellen. I see that there are many, many questions pouring in since um, your presentation. I will start by one um, that was asked, uh, what struggles are Canadian and foreign companies experiencing in Hong Kong at the moment? Anything specific for foreign companies versus local? I don't think so. There's a very large Canadian um, population in, in Hong Kong. I think it's the second or third largest population, Canadians. Our Canadian passport holders and the Chamber of Commerce here is also the largest uh, chamber, can, uh, Canadian chamber um, outside of Canada um, in the world. Um, so there's a lot of Canadian support here and um, the government's also very helpful. So I would say that if you're a Canadian business and you have a office here or you have a company here, you're going to get the same support as a local business um, to help you succeed through a difficult time. Um, I see a lot of Surprisingly for me, I help people set up companies. I help people do accounting. I help people enter in the China market, set up companies in China. And I thought with the COVID virus, everyone would come to a dead stop. But actually, it was the opposite. People are calling you up saying, I was sitting at home with my spreadsheet going, I need to find a new uh, way to sell something. Uh, what do you suggest? How do I structure this the right way? Or I need to trademark something and then get it into the market once all this goes away. So we're actually seeing a lot of, of new business and also from, from Canada. Uh, I've seen Winnipeg, uh, Halifax, and places in Canada I don't always deal with. Um, so it's very normal as, as far as I can see. People are thinking about going outside of their comfort zones. And, and I think to 
if you're not already outside of Canada or outside of North America doing business, to go to Asia is a bit of a, a, a long um, uh, guesswork and plan for you to do. It's, it's, you don't know what's going to happen when you get there. Um, but there is help there. I'll help people and talk to them until I'm blue in the face to make sure they know what they're doing before they do it um, and make sure it's the right move for them. Um, and then there's lots of support when you get here. But I don't, I don't say people should uh, come here and just go, I'm here, plan it, we'll work through with you, or so other people in Hong Kong will help me work through it, and then take it from there. I don't see any Canadian uh, specific problems they're facing. On the, on the contrary, I think they're actually doing quite well, the ones that are still here. Yeah, and it's great to hear. Um, that's what I've seen so far as well from personal experiences, but it's great to hear that it's happening a little bit uh, larger and to hear actual cases uh, continuing to, like you say, uh, use this uh, moment um, and take advantage of this time to really prepare for the entry into the market into Asia and uh, and. Uh, prepare in advance. Um, mm. I, have an, uh, I have a lot of actually questions, Callan, so <laughs> uh, you'll be Go here with us for a little bit before you fall asleep. Um, which sectors do you think will revive first? Where do we start? How do we rebuild? Um, they are, the question comes from an early stage investor with global portfolio. Um, certainly uh, manufacturing in China has come uh, back uh, first, because manufacturing is a key to the China market. It only applies, accounts for I think 43% of GDP manufacturing now. The other side is service industry. So service industry, Hong Kong, has been very depressed. In China, it's certainly come back as well. So education, elderly care, um, uh, anything to do with sort of uh, elderly care, because of very large aging population, schools, a lot of schools have been closed. How do you get kids back up to speed again very, very quickly? So education centers for kids, that's going to be another big thing as well. They have suffered tremendously in Hong Kong, the education uh, sector. Um, and it's looking for new technology to replace that. So technology, education, elderly care, manufacturing. And uh, I, I suppose um, artificial intelligence is another big in the world. It's going to be, do you have your passport? You're clean of the COVID virus. Do you have a passport? And I think technology is going to play, play a big role in that too. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think a lot of those sectors are uh, very strong here in Canada. And hopefully, especially, if, for example, in the AI, I know that Montreal is a hub and has a lot of uh, experience and has uh, on the international stage. So I think um, doing business in Asia will have a lot of uh, help in that regard. Um, the, I have another question coming in. The uplift of booked hotels in China was based on internal travel. How realistic is it for Hong Kong to improve the hotel or tourism industry in the next six months to 12 months? Um, <clears throat> I would say it's going to take a bit longer for Hong Kong. There's been some new hotels um, developed and they've delayed their opening for six months. So I think we're looking at 2021 to see an upturn in those markets. Um, I think for globally, the global chains have suffered a lot already. Hong Kong relies upon tourism, and if there's no flights coming in, I think I had another slide earlier, which I didn't give anybody, but there's a, the, the number of flights coming in, passengers went from up here down to almost zero very, very quickly, and that impacted the hotels. And none of the people in Hong Kong who would maybe stay in a hotel as a, a staycation, it's a very popular thing in Hong Kong, you stay in a hotel in your own city, you get the swimming pool and the buffet, they didn't want to stay in a hotel for somebody who maybe had the virus, was under quarantine, and you don't know if they've got it. So uh, I think for hotels and uh, restaurants, uh, they're going to suffer a lot. But I think once the flights return, uh, not as the cruise ships, the flights return, you'll see the whole hotel industry rise up again very, very quickly. That's fantastic to hear. I look forward to uh, traveling back and uh, seeing the city. If you want to come to Hong Kong now <laughs> and you want to have 14 days quarantine, the hotels, five-star hotels are the cheapest I've ever seen. Wow. Okay. Good to keep in mind once, once we're allowed to fly out in Canada. Um, another question coming in. How easy is it for Canadians to travel oh, exactly along the, that line? Travel between Hong Kong and China at the Lawbu Hong Kong Shenzhen border, is it 14 days quarantine on both sides and getting a new visa to enter into China? Um, you cannot go through Lo Wu or Lok Ma Chao borders just now, they are closed. There's only one border checkpoint open 
and that is the one on the Zhuhai Macau Hong Kong Bridge. Um, you can go to China, you'll be quarantined 14 days in China, um, probably at a government center, not a hotel. Um, and when you come back to Hong Kong, you'll be quarantined again for 14 days. Uh, so I would not advise coming to Hong Kong at this time. Um, getting a visa at the border, I, it, it's, it, when the border is working, it is sometimes possible. It's sometimes not possible, depending on the weather. Okay. So, so again, um, if you're coming to Hong Kong, get your visa before you come is my advice. Or you can get your visa in Hong Kong. You go to the China Travel Service, CTS, you can usually get a visa same day. Some of the travel agencies will take your passport and bring it back to your hotel same day with the passport pictures and get it granted. Or you can get it over two or three days. Okay, that's good. And what happens in quarantine in Hong Kong? Are you staying also in a Hong Kong hotel or are you in a government designated area? Is it also 14 days? And I, I, I believe in your presentation, you mentioned those 14 days, but maybe yes, you can yes. describe what that quarantine life is like. Um, I haven't been in quarantine myself, but I can only tell you <laughs> what I, I've read and what I've seen. Um, if you come from Canada to Hong Kong and you have, you, you'll be tested. Um, it was at the Asia World Expo. I think they've moved that to the Regal Hotel in, in Hong Kong you'll be tested for COVID virus. That can take uh, six to 10 hours. You have to sit around the hotel while that test result comes back. If you have had the, or you do have the virus, you'll be sent to a new territory's um, a housing estate. It's, it's a new building, which is not being completed completely yet. There's no carpet, but you'll stay there for 14 days. So they'll supply you food, uh, water, hot water, a bed, and TV and internet. So it's, it's not terrible, um, but it's not ideal. Um, if you have not got the virus, you can quarantine yourself at home if you live here or at a hotel. And they will, they will they'll check up on you. They give you a, a bracelet, um, which will check if you're still in that location all the time. Okay. And uh, how do you think that these measures will be in place for a lot longer? Is there a little timeline about how long these measures will be in place for? That's uh, the time, sh time machine question, isn't it? Where, where, where will we land? I, I don't know. The government is trying all it can to try and reduce it. They're talking about reducing the quarantine duration if you've been to China and come back to Hong Kong or vice versa. If you don't get quarantined twice because we're still one country. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they're trying to reduce that. I think as soon as they can cut down the quarantine level, they will do so. I think the government does not want to keep the airport a place you don't want to go to and uh, transportation to Hong Kong difficult. I think every country wants to open up as soon as possible. Yes. Um, can goods, uh, a lot, not along the lines of travel, but the movement of goods, can goods from Canada to China or China to Canada use Hong Kong as a pass-through? In other words, is it easy for Chinatown sent goods from Shenzhen to Hong Kong airports and to ship them out? Can I send commercial pallet of food to Hong Kong for a China customer to pick up? Yes, you can send food to Hong Kong. You need to get approval from the Hong Kong customs for clearance in Hong Kong. And once it's cleared customs, so you, make, you have to have the right documentation from Canada to make sure it's allowed in Hong Kong. And then you leave it up to your China buyer to pick it up and it's their problem to get it into China. That happens sometimes with wine. So some uh, companies in Australia have shipped wine to Hong Kong. It clears customs in Hong Kong. We're a free port for wine. There's no duty on wine. And then the buyer will take it across the border. But how they do it is their process and their cost. And do you see any slowdown due to uh, COVID at the moment? Or is it the same? Is it the... Business as usual, way. as they say. Of a business. Um, it's certainly a more sluggish. Um, uh, it's a very bad example, but when I look out the back window of our office, um, there's a few offices there. For a long time, their blinds were down, nobody's there. Um, but now the blinds are up and it's full of people working. They've all got their face mask on, <laughs> um, but, they're, but they're working. Um, the MTR, the, the transport system here, has got busier. Uh, it used to be pretty quiet. It has now got busier. So subtle signs indicate people are going back to a sense of normality. Um, not every business was able to carry on during the, this difficult time. And the, the, 
companies said work from home and they work from home. Other businesses carried on working, <coughs> working from the office. Um, so to me, I, I've seen certainly a slowdown in Hong Kong. It may take some time to bring it back up again, but it's not as dramatic a, uh, a problem, I think, as it's, I've seen in the West. Yeah, that's good. We've been, lu we've been lucky. We've been lucky. Yes, that's good to hear. The Hong Kong efficiency continues. Well, actually, um, there's a key, there's a key point that's only made to me a few weeks ago, which I actually agree with. If we hadn't had the riots, we had probably more cases of COVID virus because no tourists came from China uh, for the Chinese New Year. If we had had uh, no riots, it, we had lots of tourism here and the virus would have spread. Because there was no tourists coming here because they were afraid of the, the riots, we hadn't had very few cases. So we're quite lucky in that respect. It's your glass half full, as you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Correct, that's a correct. Good way to, that's a good way to look at it. It's, to, it's still water. <laughs> Soon you'll be able to, I, I do have a lot more questions, but sure, sure, you'll be it. able no, to enjoy the no, gym. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> Other than the medical sector, which sectors are succeeding in Asia despite COVID-19? Where do you see opportunities for Canadian companies? I think I said earlier, I mean, education is one, elderly care is, is another, um, food. Um, in, in Asia, people still see the Canadian brand and the, and the flag as a very high end brand. So uh, meat products, cheese products, uh, uh, wine products, you name it, anything you make in food or grow in Canada is something that Asia wants to have. They see it as quality. Uh, so that's a, a, a big uh, thumbs up to that. Um, I've always said that for Canada, technology is a very key area of Canadian mantra. Really great technology out of Canada. Green technology especially. There's a lot of money, especially in the stock markets here for green tech. Um, surprisingly, I've probably seen more uh, cannabis oil uh, people in Hong Kong from Canada than I have ever seen. Um, it's still more or less illegal in Hong Kong, but it doesn't mean to say you can't raise money in the stock market here. Um, and you, can't, you can also sell it to China. And China has a huge requirement for cannabis oil at this moment in time uh, for medical uh, requirements and they're also producing a lot as well so there's lots of things like that that are, are coming along um, but I think anything that Canada currently produces and, and has a, a market for its domestic market or a US market there's a market for it in Asia too and um, you have to tweak what you're doing and how you're selling it understand your local market that's very important I always say come to Hong Kong see it here go across the border get a feel for the dynamics of, of Guangdong province, not give an idea of what they're looking for as, as a market. Each province in China is very different and very unique. Different dialects, different eating habits and different foods that they like, and also what they're buying. So if you're gonna if you've got some nice high-end scarves or clothes or watches, China wanna buy it if it's got the right uh, cache value. But there's other things that Canada produce, and it's that flag and that image of quality, which other countries don't always have. That's always uh, something we hear often. It's good to hear that we still have that, uh, that uh, branding, Canada brand. Um, you were talking about a little earlier about how the different provinces have different um, consuming habits, languages, dialects. Um, I have a question here. Uh, I've heard that small businesses in South China is not recovering. The economy is slow. People don't have money and business is slow. It looks like Canadian small businesses will be the same here if we're locked down any longer. What's it like in Hong Kong? Are people, are consumers spending their money? Uh, consumers are spending their money. Uh, people in Hong Kong save for rainy days. Uh, it's more of a Chinese uh, advantage, I think, here. Um, I think you're smiling, so you're obviously doing the same thing yourself. Um, <laughs> I'm online shopping all the course, way. I just spend all my money as, as soon as I get it. Um, so I, I think uh, for small businesses here, it depends what it is. I think uh, the, the hospitality industry has suffered a great deal. Even old uh, Cha Chan Tang, old old. Uh, tea shops here who've been around 50, 60 years have closed down, uh, mainly because of last year with the protests and then this year the virus. It's a double whammy effect. They'll still come back. There's still a demand for it, so it will come back. Um, again, it depends on how high your rent is. Rents in Hong Kong are really high. So a lot of the restaurants and bars that have been outside of my office for many, many years 
have closed down. Some have reopened and at the, the wrong time. They opened up, I think, the week of the, the coronavirus became a big thing here. So they've been closed until it goes away. So they're still paying very high rent. So rents are the way that kills business. So there's been a lot of negotiation with landlords trying to bring the rents down to allow businesses to survive this period. So that would be a deciding factor if landlords actually do that. Um, the government uh, uh, shopping centres have actually given rent waivers. So if you've got a, a shop in a government shopping mall, which are still quite large around town, um, there's rent waivers. So I think small businesses, they either succeed because they've been around and they've got reserves, um, but maybe their staff have not survived. And the staff have not survived or they've been furloughed then is a problem. But the government in Hong Kong have actually offered money to people as well as they have in other countries to make you keep your staff and they'll pay up to, up to a certain amount of money for those staff to be retained as long as you don't lay them off. So there are um, money being paid here by the government to try and keep people in jobs. And that might help people spend a bit more as well to try and yeah. keep the economy going elsewhere. But I think for small businesses, it's really tough. For large businesses, it's very tough. But Hong Kong, as I say, has been pretty lucky. It's not been the full uh, tsunami effect that other places have felt. Yeah. Um, you were talking a little bit about uh, rent relief uh, for the government uh, shopping centers. Have you seen that for other, uh, is there any other government measures to help other landlords and tenants in that regards? And you were talking about negotiations, you know, if they've been mostly fruitful or have they been so-so or 50-50? Yes. Private landlords want, want their money because they've maybe got big mortgages on the property as well to pay the, to get the property, they've got to, have a rental income. So it's a bit tricky sometimes. Um, I think the banks could be a bit more helpful here on that. And I think the government's trying to get them to do so. Um, the, there's certainly um, small business loans and enterprise loans and sometimes grants from the government, which they are actually pushing on people. Please take this, please make use of it. Um, it's certainly audited by the government. You can't just get the money and walk away. You have to make sure you do certain things. The government actually has come through to sort of say, we try and help everybody through this difficult time. So I'm quite surprised because usually in Hong Kong, it's the government's very hands off. There's very few taxis here. There's very few other things. Let the entrepreneur do his or her thing. So I mean, quite surprised how supportive they have been. But I don't have any particular uh, cases regarding how negotiations have gone for the non-government uh, shopping malls. I think there's a the government's trying to push the large tycoons to help. Uh, and I think there's some headway in that. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. And I know it's a evolving, um, as it is in Canada, it's a evolving yes. measures. You know, it's not uh, measures or legislations that have been drafted and prepared and reviewed, you know, where they're uh, going at this uh, as, they, uh, as time progresses and as the needs uh, from the population arises. Um, I have another question here about um, the impact of COVID-19 on Chinese students going to Canada. Will things return to pre-COVID-19 levels when travel will be allowed or will the impact be long term where online options and local options mean that we won't recover pre-COVID-19 levels? I don't know is the answer to that one. I, I don't know enough about um, student uh, movements. Um, what I can see in, in global news, even, even for students going to UK, uh, my home country, um, it's having a big impact on education there too, because international students are the ones that pay the most for their education and it helps universities survive. So trying to find ways to still charge students, even if they're not in the country that they're in. Um, so the e-learning again is one way of doing that. But again, it's one of these time machine questions. When will we land so that we can start traveling again when we're getting on planes um, will there be a, a QR code password passport required for a student to leave China saying that you haven't got the virus to get into Canada etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean I still think glass half full we're looking at the rest of this year fixing what's happened the first half of the year and we'll get to a, a, a point hopefully early 2021 where things are back to normal but I still think there'll be a, a vaccine coming around at some point. Everyone's put lots of money into that. Uh, so I'm always class half full. That's always uh, the way to look at things, and I concur with that way. Um, we were talking about landlords a little earlier. 
Um, what is the impact of COVID-19 on the real estate market in Hong Kong? Um, are there some sectors, I know you mentioned tourism that was impacted heavily, um, and even the little uh, ta tan tan. Are there other sectors that you feel have been also impacted? Uh, property prices, during SARS, property prices for Dubai went down quite a lot, or lots of good deals. We haven't seen that this time, uh, surprisingly. I haven't seen it uh, as far as uh, the sale of property. That's the domestic properties. Um, uh, rentals have certainly gone down. Uh, a lot of empty premises, both domestic and commercial, uh, means that negotiating for rental changes is actually a very good thing to do right now. Um, so if anybody in Canada is thinking about buying a property in Hong Kong right now, it's not going to be a bargain yet. It might be later on. Um, I think from, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, if you look at the airline industry here, we've got a number of small airlines here. Um, and also Cathay is our predominant airline here. All the planes are grounded. That has a big impact on how they can uh, move forward later on and get back to normal. So tourism, again, is one of our key things. Ocean Park is closed. Disney Park, Disneyland is closed. Um, everything's more or less, as far as tourism and groups of people, has closed. Cinemas have closed everywhere around the world. Um, Rugby Sevens in Hong Kong this year has also been postponed to October. Let's see if October happens or not. You've got to get players from Canada, Fiji, Australia, right, USA, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, come here maybe we can't and you can't you can do it virtually a playstation game of, of rugby <laughs> sevens but every every business is impacted in canada it's the same situation in hong kong and i say i said to you because we're not locked down and we can go outside and still spend money and and buy food and uh, buy wine and eat out it's still got a sense of normality it's just finding that new normal and that helps the economy keep going, I think. But, uh, I think that the help, like you mentioned before, um, by having it not a complete lockdown is helping Hong Kong versus more Western countries and namely Canada, which has uh, many businesses closed, although we are seeing as in Quebec, a slow start of reopening of businesses. Mm. Um, if we go back to real estate, uh, are, real, are Hong Kong real estate companies eyeing the, for international opportunities more than locally? Again, I don't know the answer to that one. I can, I can only do it from what I've read in the press that I think the large developers are always looking for things outside of their home market. They're always going to look for developments and they're still building things in other markets too. Um, especially in Asia, uh, and also Canada, Australia, I've got a lot of uh, investment there in China too. But, you know, Thailand gets a lot of development uh, from Hong Kong developers. Although Thailand's quite locked down, the, the building work is still carrying on. <clears throat> um, but I think there's always going to be eyeing for other opportunities. So as I was saying earlier, I'm saying to Canadians, think about opportunities in Asia. So you're locked down there, what can you do across here? And I'm sure people in Hong Kong who are developers are looking at, well, what is available elsewhere? Maybe a developer's gone bankrupt because of this virus. What can I buy and bring it up again? So these kind of things might be happening as well. Yes, I think that that's, a, that's a, lots of opportunities that may arise also amongst uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Um, I have another question here about um, from Sonia, our PHKCBA National Treasurer. Um, Hi, Sonia. <laughs> about the possibility of Hong Kong protests coming back um, after COVID-19. Do you see that it will continue um, to affect tourism from mainland China? I think that the protests have already started back. Uh, they're, they're, I don't want to get into politics, but um, the liaison office for Hong Kong, Macau in Hong Kong, has, has sought to, uh, that we should bring in the Article 23 legislation that was put down in 2003, that's um, for treason and subversion uh, attempts. Um, and they're pushing for that. And also a national anthem uh, uh, law. We have, we have a, no law. If you, if you insult the national anthem here, there's no problem just now, but they want to bring that into Hong Kong. And that'll probably bring people out onto the streets again. There's still a lot of um, concern about the future of Hong Kong. I think that needs to be maybe thought about by China before this all settles down. If you say, 
listen, it'll be 100 years, 132 systems, I think will solve lots of problems. But 50 years, the clock is ticking very quickly for some people. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not COVID. Um, so I think um, there will be more protests. I don't think it'll be as as bad as it was. I'm hoping it won't be, but I don't see the the steam and the the energy there um, as it was last year. I don't think it worked. It didn't help. <clears throat> Excuse me. It didn't help. Um, there are other ways of doing it, and I think there's going to be a vote for LegCo in September this year. So many people might get, <clears throat> excuse me, many people might get um, the Democratic Party into power and that will have a political impact in Hong Kong rather than using violence. But I think you'll still see some flashes of protests. There were some protests happening against the quarantine sites as well early yeah. on. Don't, don't bring the quarantine to my, 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 my estate. Okay, yeah. Well, Hong is very small. Where else are you going to put it? So it was a uh, that's that went away as well. Yeah, well, I think that uh, we saw from as you were mentioning with the new uh, uh, elections that may be happening, it will help because I think uh, when I was there last time, it was right after I think the district elections, if I recall, or the municipal ones, and that already you saw a big shift and a slowdown of the, yeah. the protests already there, and it was <clears throat> much safer last time I was there. Thankfully, I think the voting and the political um way of doing things would probably serve people better they've got a voice then at LegCo. Mm -hmm. whether or not that will help hong kong i do not know yet uh we have few, we're almost running out of time i'll try to squeeze in another question if you'll allow um one of the questions that came in is um a very important factor for uh, the post-pandemic and long-term planning is the U.S. trade and economic policies towards China. One can safely predict that it will downgrade very rapidly. How would Hong Kong adjust to it? What is the implication for Canadian businesses? And there's a follow-up to that. And will trade between China and the rest of the world, U.S., Canada, slow down? Um, well, although we're one country, two systems, um, Hong Kong is a special arrangement with America. So if there is a major upscaling of a trade dispute with China, it doesn't impact Hong Kong directly because we're a separate trading relationship with America, more or less. Um, we haven't got the tariffs or anything else that uh, China has. Um, but if China catches a cold or it sneezes, we catch the cold in Hong Kong. A bad analogy during COVID, but it impacts us as well. <clears throat> um, I also know that America's unhappy with the Hong Kong uh, protests and that they were looking at um, uh, having some sanctions against Hong Kong too. Personally, I think America and the rest of the world has got too much um, invested in Hong Kong already. Most of the top American, North American, European companies, Australian companies, headquarters are here in Hong Kong. Uh, this is where they put their base. Either here or Singapore, but mostly it's Hong Kong. And they use Hong Kong as their base camp, Mount Everest again, to get to China. So to start making Hong Kong difficult for the world would be a problem for companies around the world too. Um, second question you had there, I forget what it was. It was another part of your question. Oh, this was a multi-part question. Um, if... if uh... How will Hong Kong adjust? What are the implications for Canadian uh, businesses? It, it wouldn't have any impact on Canada. I think <clears throat> what I've seen is that there are more Canadian businesses being impacted by US policy right now, that they no longer um, want, or they no longer feel that US is their number one trading partner. They're looking elsewhere. So I think look to Europe, look to Canada, New Zealand, and look to Hong Kong and the wider Asia. There's a market there for Canadians. So I think um, that's maybe the best way to look at it, that Hong Kong is a, a beacon, a, a lighthouse that you can place yourself. Forget what's happening around. <clears throat> you could be having a storm or a tornado. We still seem to survive. And if you're going to do business, do it here. America's got too many problems, I think, with Canada right now. On another yeah. on the final, I'll squeeze <clears throat> the last question. Um, for 
Hong Kong businesses. Um, you know, I know that the traditional mindset is you have to be in the office and on the ground to do business and you have to have a physical space. Uh, those are important uh, way of doing business traditionally, but considering the global lockdown, travel restrictions, COVID-19, do you think that there'll be a shift in the future, in the months to come? Uh, long term, perhaps, and also if you think that Hong Kong businesses will also shift to more and more online services and other measures. Mm. Um, I think, again, I see this news about the world's changed forever. I hate using a video uh, uh, call with people. I like to talk to them face to face, get a better idea and be able to discuss things. I like to stand in a room and talk and see everybody who's here rather than just be me talking to you, although I, I like talking to you as well. So we still need to have that interaction with people. Certainly for the time being, this is the best way to, to at least get something out there and still talk about things to a large group of people. Um, I don't think Hong Kong is, you can still do business this way. Many of my clients come to Hong Kong once a year or every two or three years, not all the time. So they can still do business. They can still have an office here or a, resident office here in a company and still do all the same uh, clever billing and uh, business that they were doing elsewhere by sending emails and arranging things and getting somebody to, like me to do something for a client. So you can still do things by remote control. I always tell clients, when they're asleep in Ottawa, I'm awake in Hong Kong. So it's like 24 hours a day. When you're waking up, you do your bit and then you say, Calum, can you do this, this and this? Then I do the rest for you. So there's always a back office way of doing things without you having to come here. Um, Certainly it helps, but in Hong Kong, we still write checks. We actually handwrite checks. Um, that's not how it works in the West in most countries any longer. So we still like traditional ways of doing things, uh, meeting people, having lunches, um, using checkbooks. Um, I'm not so old that I can't do a transfer online, but you know, there's some things we're still stuck with. But I think in, in Chinese culture, meeting somebody, you learn a lot more about that person and you get, you get more business that way. But I think certainly most of my clients come to Hong Kong very uh, infrequently and they still do really good business. Yes, I think that uh, with this global mindset and uh, as you were mentioning, um, I could say like, you know, working with uh, my offices, we say that it's uh, you know, DS around the world because we're, we have offices around the world. So it just continues and, you know, for urgent matters, yes. I've actually seen that done where, you know, we work on part of the, do the agreement for a few hours, for 12 hours and shift it over. And, you know, just the work just continues, which is the fantastic thing about doing bit from Canada and China yes. and Hong Kong, um, doing business but around. But Hong Kong is, is, is a very expensive city, but actually having a business here is not. No. We've got very few taxis. As far as, yeah. no, the government doesn't really interfere. There's not much tax. Um, and setting it up is very easy. You have to do audit once a year. Closing it down, you have to register to close it down. But apart from that, it's very straightforward. Um, so I don't know why more people don't just use Hong Kong as a place just to, to, to put their, their flag in the sand, say, I'm here. You tell yeah. somebody in China, I have an office in Hong Kong. How many staff do you have? Oh, I can't remember. You've got zero staff. But... <laughs> As far as you're concerned, you've got an office there. It's all about um, giving some substance to what you have here and making it usable. Yes. Um, so thank you, Callan, once again. We're a little bit past time. Um, there, I know that there's a lot of questions still unanswered um, in our chat. I will send them over to Callan and hopefully we'll be able to have them answered as well. Um, thank you, Callan, once again for joining us. And it was My a pleasure. great presentation as always. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was not wrong. I could keep my statement intact. Um, and uh, always for your honesty. If you need uh, toilet paper, I have lots in Hong Kong. <laughs> There'll be a link for the, uh, where you can buy them from Callan in our <laughs> follow up email. For a nominal um, fee. <laughs> uh, the presentation will be available for replay and will be sent to you by email along with the link to where you can buy the toilet paper from Talent. Uh, you'll be able to uh, go through all the elements that we've discussed. HKCB will continue to host various online events during this COVID-19, so please follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, sign up for our newsletters to stay updated as to upcoming events and webinars. And uh, HKCBA's team is available to assist you if you require with any assistance in Hong Kong and Asia related matters, please 
don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, thank you, Callan, for joining us at uh, such a late hour. We truly, truly appreciate it. It is always My fantastic pleasure. to hear from you. And I hope that you'll go and enjoy your gin and tonic and uh, rest. And for the rest of us here in Canada, and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.